So now I'm going to talk about ZFS feature flags, which you may or may not have heard about if you've been paying attention to ZFS development. So the problem that this is trying to address is that in the old world, um, ZFS on disk formats were versioned with a uh, single integer. So um, in the last Open Solaris release, for example, that number was 28. You know, that went up throughout the years whenever they introduced backwards incompatible changes to the on disk format. Um, so when Sun was kind of in charge of this, you know, there was one entity that decided this is what's in, this is what this on disk format change means. Now it gets harder um, with multiple companies um, or even different organizations working on this on ZFS where you can't really get them to agree that. Well, you don't want to try to get them to agree that like 30 means this, but also then you have the problem of like 30 impl 31 implies 30, you know, which isn't, it's kind of an artificial um, requirement usually, unless there's actual dependencies there. So, um, and uh, of course there's, there's going to be uh, organizations that may want to maintain something outside of Illumos for, you know, maybe for a while before they put it back or maybe forever if it doesn't make sense to put it back into a, essential thing they they still want to be able to they want to be able to write the fact that this we well we want them to be able to write this uh, the fact that this is incompatible with everyone else to their pool so we don't try to open them all right so this kind of this was originally proposed um, by the ZFS working group um, like probably a year ago ish um, and Matt sent a really nice big long explanatory email to the um, old ZFS list um, kind of explaining the vision for this. So that's the link. When we put this up on the web later, you can go read that. Um, so last summer, Delphix had an intern, Basil Crow, who actually, what, what I'm going to talk about is all stuff that exists, and probably most of that was done by him last summer. Um, <coughs> and then me and Matt kind of cleaned it up, pulled, it in, pulled part of it into the uh, kind of the Delphix OS. It's in there right now. We're running it. Um, and then we plan to push that back to Illumos soon. Um, so, kind of, I'm gonna, I want to give kind of an overview of like, if you are a user of ZFS, kind of independent of being a developer, what does this, what does this mean? What are you gonna see in, on in the command line when you're administering your systems? So the legacy version numbers will still exist from one to 28. You, they work just the same way they always did. Um, and you can tr continue using zpool upgrade the same way you always did to change between those if you need to change between them. Um, feature flags is given this arbitrary version number of 1000 that's just kind of like, it's way far away that it's never going to conflict with anyone who doesn't, who continues to make version numbers. Um, <laughs> So kind of the idea is, um, at one point, you enable feature flags, you set the version number to 1,000, and it never changes again. And we've actually tried to remove it from the GUI and just kind of say, like, there's no longer a version number here. Um, or you are running a feature flags pool. Um, and then what's kind of going to happen is gonna, there's going to be independent flags for each kind of on-disk feature. And those get enabled independently of each other um, so that you don't have this artificial dependencies of versions on lower numbers. Um, you can still have dependencies between features, and we'll get to that, because that's obviously something you're going to need. Um, right. Quick question, question on this version 1000. I'm hoping that Care's been taken to make sure that this doesn't somehow mistakenly imply that we can import versions 30 through 1. Yes, Care's been taken right. about that. At one point, we realized it didn't, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, See, but it does imply that you have everything through 28. So to enable feature flags, you must enable, it kind of implicitly goes, jumps to 28, and then to 1,000. It allows us, by having this jump, it allows us to have at least the theoretical possibility of in the future supporting you know, Oracle versions 29, 30, 31, if you know, we reverse engineer them, or they tell us what the on format is, or something like that. Or someone leaves on the source code. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. So th and so, these these flags are going to ex be exposed as pool properties now. Um, so the property name is going to they get kind of lengthy, but 
I don't know. It's gonna be so you're gonna have the standard you see like feature and then a little at symbol just like you see with like the user at and all you know with all the other properties. Well, all the properties and the data file systems. So I think this is the first one pool, but um, and then we put in like you have the organization name and then feature name. That's just kind of to ensure that we don't shoot ourselves in the foot where two organizations decide to independently develop some feature with the same name, which is plausible. Um, basically, the, the user interface will always like let you abbreviate that as long as it's actually not ambiguous. So we have the example here of a real feature that I'm going to talk about later. Um, the feature at com.delphix async destroy. Um, you can always just specify feature at async destroy for that. Um, unless someone else decides to create a feature named async destroy. Is your thinking that when features get pushed up to a Lumos, that that becomes feature at, a, at, at org on a Lumos, or would you just keep that? I mean, what's the thinking on that? Yeah, so the thinking is that um, when it gets pushed up to a Lumos, that uh, there would be basically uh, an alias uh, for this encoded in the um, in the code, cool. so that you know, then when you create when you create a pool with this feature, it would actually turn into work on Lumos on async destroy. But then, the code in Lumos and you know in Delphix would know that oh, these are what the, actually mean the same thing. So there's the, the kind of uh, unob objectionable thing where it would be tagged with you know Delphix or or Nextent or, or Joint or whomever. Um, but you know, that's that's kind of necessary so that our, all of our users would be able to Sure, no, it, it makes sense. I, mean, I think it, it's just nice for to, for everyone to have a way of knowing that, oh, this feature's actually made it into core, it's made it into a Lumos, yeah. I can depend on this, it's not just a Delphix. So Absolutely, and knowing when you put it on your yeah. USB stick that someone's going to be able to read it if, if they don't have someone yeah. else's yeah. operating system. In the context of the new Lumos, the best word is the new Lumos. Can we defer that? Like, yeah. you can look at it in the code review. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, these features, you know, so the properties now have three values, and this is slightly confusing, but I'll try to explain why it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, so there's, there's three possible values. There's disabled, enabled, and active. So disabled is exactly what you expect it to be. It's like, you know, this is some new feature, and your old pool, you know, it's not enabled. It's like you had version 28, and this is version 29, and version 29 is disabled. Like, nothing's going to get written to disk that has anything to do with this feature. Um, enabled means that the administrator has gone in and said, I want to enable this feature. Um, but there's this thing that happens here where you don't, there's, for the most part, in most things, this doesn't actually mean that there's any on-disk format change that's been made that, um, that, kind of, that stops anyone else from importing this pool. So it's kind of just a marker to say, if the software understands this feature um, and it wants to use it, it's free to do so. And then when that happens, it gets changed to active, at which point other software knows, I, if I don't understand this, I can't import this pool, um, if that makes sense. And so that happens automatically the first time you use the feature? That is, that's very cool. Yeah, that so solved a really nasty problem. So in the past, basically, with the old version numbers, we can conflated the ideas of enabled and active. Yeah. So yeah. as soon as you do Z full upgrade, um, so you did Z full upgrade and you enabled, you know, RAID Z support, then you want to go move it back to an old system. Well, you can't, even if you never created any RAID Z devices. Well, it means that, that you know, a system upgrade gave you the world's scariest dialogue box of like, do you want to cross a Rubicon and never return? You're just like, um, yeah. no, cancel. <laughs> so here there's actually the potential to return, um, and, and with Chris's feature, it's actually pretty easy to return. Yeah, 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 it gets even better. Features can unenable themselves if they support it. Or un unactivate themselves. Unactivate themselves, yeah. even better. Deactivate not disable. You don't want them to disable themselves, but so deactivate themselves. That's really cool. So that is cool. feature is not active, you have to say that you can only set it to enable. But if it's not active, why couldn't I disable it to prevent it from accidentally becoming active later? You can. We just didn't write that code. Okay. It's kind of like a, that's, we probably I like to that. do that. We haven't. It, it gets a little bit tricky because of the dependencies. The okay. dependencies make it non-trivial, but it's right. definitely doable. Because even if it's not enabled, if one of the de if it's something depends on it that's enabled, but then so it's kind of we need to think about it. But it's definitely like on the you know um, somewhere in the future. Um, yeah. So one of the things we want to do is actually we want we want to put something in our in our appliance, but still give our customer. You know, if we want to move our customers back for whatever reason they don't like the newer version, you know, 
the they'll if the feature that I wrote you know becomes deactivated, then they can move back to an older version without problem. Um, hey Chris, is that also true for legacy? For any legacy uh, version that you would upgrade to? You so mean the numbers? So, like for example, you go to feature flags, but you were on you know you're going from version twenty to feature flags. That no, it's not. Once you're in twenty eight, once you're in feature flags, just you're stuck. on feature flags. You're stuck in feature flags actually. Now yeah. you can't even go back to twenty eight. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the, forever. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I just want to make sure that. We're right. Yeah, that, that's an important there. distinction. And the, there's still the, a Rubicon. It's just one. Time. There's, there's a, one Rubicon. There's a really important distinction. One in that final Rubicon. <laughs> <laughs> there is. It's up next one. It's up. It's up to the individual feature. So there may one day be features that are incapable of deactivating for themselves for whatever reason. No matter how hard you try, you can't get rid of them. I can't imagine one. But so there could be something where, like, when you when you enable it, it actually needs to go look at the current on disk state and change it to be represented in some new way. Probably what that would do would just say, okay, when you enable me, I'm gonna act I activate myself immediately, I go make these on disk changes and I'm active forever. You can never deactivate. So well, an example of one that, that would do that intentionally would be work, right? Even though there's no you don't have to do it. Um, you know, from a policy standpoint, what you point to unidirectional transition. Historically how many features could it deactivate? Um, most of them. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, it's like because I mean, you, the, 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 presumably the user quotas could have that, that could have deactivated itself. Yeah. And like, well, and the other the other interesting thing <laughs> is that um, uh, yeah, did you talk about read-onlyness. Yeah. I yeah, I get a couple Later. of slides okay. down. So there, there's another interesting. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, even more magical this, things that happen. Very nice. <laughs> um, so mo most properties and uh, most of the things that we've got that new most of the versions that we've implemented. Could have been read only backwards compatible, and we can do that with the feature flags. Looks so. like. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I said you can't set them to disable. Like I said, we might want to change that. Um, there's a couple like small things here, like enable, a <coughs> and you know just to make things easier, if you enable a feature on the command line, it automatically six to version one thousand, um, and if you it automatically enables dependencies. So. Is there, any, is there any warnings given about that? No. First time somebody does it, they are crossing a boundary. Yeah. They are crossing a boundary, yeah. So Same thing with ZFS destroy. Yeah. Well, and ZFS 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 upgrade. Same, same thing with RM. RM. Like you, you're setting a property called feature at whatever. Hopefully yeah. you know why you're doing that. Yep. Um, so here's just an example. Create a pool with the old version, 28. So if you list, and I kind of cut everything else out of the, the Z pool list, but so you see that the version is set to 28, and the feature is not enabled because you created a pool of version 28. And then the command that you're going to run to actually enable the feature is zpool set feature at async destroy equals enabled, name of the pool. And then if you run the zpool list again, you'll see that the version number disappeared, and this is now enabled. So cool. Might be a little hard to run. That's cool. All right, I think, yes, this is what Matt was going to start talking about. So how, what happens when you try to open an incompatible pool? So there's another, there's a distinction. There's two types of kind of features that, you know, Matt said have happened throughout ZFS development. There are features, there, there are obviously features that like once you've, once you've made them like older versions just can't do anything to the pool. There are also features, um, so like you create a RAID Z VDEP, right? There's no way that that old software can know anything about how to deal with this. Yeah. Then there's other things that you actually can still read the pool just fine. There's just like extra information laying around somewhere that you don't understand, but as long as you ignore it properly, there's no problem. Um, so when I get to async destroy, for example, that's one of these features that you can still read the pool. There's just this extra metadata about cleaning up, about cleaning up free blocks um, that needs to be stored. So it actually, what it allows you to do is you'll be able to open the pool read-only um, still. 